the International Olympiad Medalist, uh, a function which is held uh, uh, by the Homi Bhava Center in collaboration with the Infosys Foundation Bangalore and the TIFR Endowment Fund. So as is the norm in this function, uh, which we hold every year on this day, 22nd December, uh, this is actually the birthday of uh, Srinivas Ramanujan. I'm sure all of you know his name, the uh, famous Indian mathematician. So uh, this function uh, is always held on this day, on 22nd December. So uh, according to the tradition that we have been following, uh, there are two lectures before the formal function, which will start uh, at 12 noon. Before that, we have two lectures today by two eminent speakers. And it's my pleasure to welcome now the first speaker of today, Professor Rupa Manjari Ghosh, the Vice Chancellor of Shivnadar University, Uttar Pradesh. Professor Ghosh uh, is a professor of physics with special interest in uh, quantum optics and laser physics. Professor Ghosh obtained her MSc degree in physics from the University of Calcutta in 1980 and PhD in physics from the University of Rochester in 1987. She was at the Jawaharlal Nehru University from 1988 till 2012, where she held many important academic and administrative positions, including Dean of School of Physical Sciences. She joined the Shivnadar University in 2012 as the founding director of the School of Natural Sciences. Later, she held several other leading positions at Shivnadar and became its vice chancellor in 2016. She has also served as the Chief Advisor for the National Council of Educational Research and Training, NCRT, science textbooks for class 9 and 10. Besides her contribution to science research and training from university to school level, she is also well known for her stand and efforts to bring in gender, gender justice and environmental consciousness in the higher education system. Her research interests are in experimental and theoretical quantum optics, laser physics, nonlinear optics, magneto optics, and quantum information. She has made pioneering contributions in quantum optics and quantum information, particularly in the creation and use of sources of single photons and entangled photon pairs. Professor Ghosh was awarded the Sri Shakti Science Samman in 2008. And today she will speak on light and atoms. So welcome, Professor Ghosh. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and uh, honor for me to be with you this morning. Uh, this is my first visit, believe it or not, to this center, though, you know, uh, to TIFR and other places I've visited many times. And I thought uh, when Anvish uh, commanded that I come and talk about experimental physics a bit, I thought uh, I would get recharged by all the energy that I see in this morning in this room. So uh, let me get started. This is not a very, very uh, uh, formally structured one, but I will talk about a bit of our research, but hopefully some points would get through. So uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me if you do not understand something or you want some clarification. So I start with a, a very uh, basic uh, kind of a definition that NCRT textbook writers are uh, often tempted to do, give. So often people ask me what is really physics and in NCRT textbooks you would find. Uh, this is what we wrote in one of the introductions that physics is a systematic attempt to understand natural phenomena in as much depth and detail as possible. Why the hell do you do this? You do this so that you can use this knowledge to predict, modify and control phenomena. Now that, that is an important part. When you understand, then only you can try to control. And that uh, itchy feeling is with all physicists. There are two qualifying remarks I have put in, in here that uh, in Physics, uh, often you find people as segregating themselves as theoretical physicists and experimental physicists. Uh, the, work, the area I work in is possible to do both. And it's important to remember that physics is actually an experimental science. And theories are constructed to explain experimental facts. And the way, if you look at the title that, that I have put in, is actually uh, the evolution of physics happens when theory and experiment go hand in hand. And uh, beautiful offshoots in terms of applications often come out. 
It is also important because of the kind of uh, implications that I will talk about today that physics tries to answer the question how things happen in nature and it does not bother going into the details of why it happens that way. For example, you heard that I work in quantum optics or quantum mechanics. If you ask me why that works and nothing else works, I do not have an answer. Believe in God if you wish to, but the idea is that we, we separate it out through methodologies that we call scientific methodologies into the domain of what science is or physics theory is all about and what the domain of belief or philosophy uh, etcetera are. So, I think it is very important for us to keep that distinction in mind when we approach uh, uh, the, the scientific domain through methodologies devised by ourselves sort of to protect and remember that we try to answer the question how things happen in nature and not get into why it happens that way and no other way. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know I can go on and on, but let me just get started with one example of what I just said that uh, once you start understanding phenomena, you would be able to control it. A, a domain that everybody in physics talks about is nonlinearity, 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 you must have heard some bit of it, but essentially let me confine myself to optics. Now, uh, what is meant by a nonlinear optical phenomena in a very general way? Uh, first, let us understand what we mean by a linear system. So, think of a pendulum and I kick it, depending on the strength of the kick, if I kick it harder, it displaces more. Okay. So, the response of the system is proportional to the strength of the kick. Now, in optics, you talk in terms of the response which is given as the polarization, which is the induced dipole moment per unit volume. So, I shine in light or shine in electric field E and the system responds, that is my stimulus, system responds by getting polarized. In a linear system, the relationship between P and E is linear. So, if I draw a curve, I will get a straight line. So, the, the constant that is sitting in, in front is uh, known as susceptibility and if I depending on the kind of unit I use, I put in this epsilon naught or not, that is not really important. Point is for a linear system, the relationship between polarization and electric field is linear. So, what is nonlinearity? Nonlinearity very easily you can imagine that when I am talking about this pendulum, if I kick it really hard, it is not going to just get linearly displaced, it is going to do funny stuff. And one way of representing all the funny stuff it does, and which is the reality really, is to put in higher order terms. Keep on putting E square, E q, E 4, so and so forth. And uh, uh, the uh, if I put in anisotropy, that is not everything is directionally symmetric, then I can write one component of the polarization as linear term, square term, cube term and so and so forth. That is. So, what you uh, understand is that uh, this could be a convergent series. Okay. So, I can say that I approximate the system by its linearity when these terms are really, really small, very tentatively speaking, but that happens because these constants that are sitting in here are actually really small uh, in, in a magnitude. A small number multiplied by fat electric fields so, somehow can make it still substantial. So, when for example, I use a laser, the electric field residing in the laser could be quite large. As a result, a small number multiplied by the square of a large number roughly can give you a response which is almost as good as the linear term. So, it would be really stupid to discard terms that are equally uh, large in uh, my response expansion. So, uh, one more thing you can actually see that the second order term which is should have been the first common nonlinear term is 0 in the bulk of a medium which has center of inversion symmetry. If I reflect one electric field and make it E min to minus E, then you can see that the term if you had center of inversion symmetry would remain the same making the second order susceptibility the same as minus of itself. So, essentially that says that that constant is actually 0 provided you have center of inversion symmetry. The most common nonlinearity you see is actually the sky 3, the, the third order susceptibility. So, this is really one way of looking at nonlinearity, this is not the only way. Remember I said that this series has to converge and in phenomena that are extremely exciting that we call resonance, sometimes these extra terms can be not so extra be the dominating one. I will not get into that. So, with this general thing, what I want to talk about is how in this domain actually seemingly uh, with the use of a medium, light can talk to light. So, normally in Maxwell's equation if you have seen those, 
uh, they are linear. I mean, you know, light crosses light without interacting. But if I put a material in there, I can make light interact with light. And one common example of this would be uh, like a spontaneous photon fission, when one photon goes into the material, splits into two, or I put in two photons, I combine them, and so on and so forth. So, this could be done either mediated uh, by another light field or so on and so forth. So, from this very general introduction, let me move to the crux of the matter for today for my task. So, essentially what I am talking about is that, uh, if I have an intense electromagnetic field, it induces a nonlinear response in the medium, uh, because uh, as a reaction the medium modifies the optical field. So, so far you have actually thought of bulk constants as constants, right. I put in electric field and there is a chi term sitting in there, chi which is a constant multiply by E gets you the polarization. What I am talking about now, chi is no longer a constant, it is actually field dependent, because as light propagates, it modifies the medium, that medium in turn is modifying the propagation of the light. In very simple physical picture, this is what nonlinearity is all about. So, what I am going to talk about is one such phenomenon, actually a little complicated one, but very, very exciting that we have spent 10 years uh, probing. And this also talks about bulk quantum mechanics at room temperature, normally things that you do not associate with quantum mechanics. If you have heard of it, you know this is a little different from Newtonian mechanics. I will not talk about the mechanics, mechanics part of it, but I will actually use, I will not get into the details of this either, but essentially tell you that there is a system which we have probed to prove the kind of things we are talking about. So, what is it that we are talking about? Uh, it is about manipulating atoms and the nice thing about people who work with lasers is that you know uh, these changes, the manipulations I am doing are not permanent. So, as long as the control laser field is on, these changes you see and as soon as the control laser field is off, you are back to your normal self. So, they are actually quite interesting for many, many applications and two kinds of effects normally you talk about when you see atom photon interactions of that kind. One is what we call dissipative or absorptive effects, right. I shine in light with an intensity I naught, it traverses a particular distance, the intensity that comes out is actually diminished. So, you are familiar with such dissipation effect is normally described by a, a complex susceptibility, the imaginary part of the complex susceptibility and even in the absence of, uh, of any, uh, any field, this would lead to a broadening of the atomic energy levels and so on and so forth. This is sort of known for some time. A conjugate part of it, which is uh, uh, the causally connected is the reactive or dispersive effect. This is denoted by the real part of the susceptibility as in a prism, you know you see dispersion effects and which is really connected always to uh, an imaginary part of the susceptibility. This should uh, lead to the other one led to a broadening of the energy level, this would lead to actually a shift of the atomic energy levels and a very famous Nobel prize winning work fall under understanding this real part of the susceptibility. So, what am I talking about? I am talking about a particular phenomenon that is called electromagnetically induced transparency, in short EIT. As the name implies, this really transmission of a resonant light through otherwise opaque medium. So, the medium was opaque, I am shining light, nothing was coming out. I use a control to make it transparent. So, the original light sort of comes through and that would happen as long as the control is on. Okay. So, the, this is something that I am going to use today and to illustrate the control that I was talking about earlier that you understand. So, very basic understanding of what absorption is all about, a very crude uh, model is that suppose I concentrate on two energy levels inside my atom, okay, the energy levels are separated by uh, energy of h bar omega naught and I shine a laser with a frequency of omega that is shown in red and omega omega naught may not be the same. You see an absorption when delta is 0, the difference between omega 0 and omega naught is nothing, then you have maximum absorption, corresponding dispersion curves looks like that. Okay. These are very standard uh, dispersion curves for uh, absorption through a two level atom. So, essentially when I shine in the laser light, I actually lift this electronic or whatever population upstairs and it all gets absorbed. So, nothing comes out of it, the light does not come out, because light has actually lifted the population upstairs and done its job. Okay. So, there is nothing left to come out. Now, if I add a third level and use a second laser, there is this profiles get drastically modified. 
and this leads to what we call a transparency window where I had maximum absorption there I now have a dip in absorption that means maximum transmission. So, where this one was actually just lifting the population up and getting absorbed now I have the red light actually coming out. Okay, so, transmission happens and this profile which is the conjugate of that gets dispersion profile gets modified with a very steep slope right here. Earlier you were never bothered about this region because everything was getting absorbed. So, nothing was coming out. So, light when it does not come out you cannot really probe. Now that I have made this little transparency window I can actually probe this region and come out with some really exciting physics. So, what is the, the, the real excitement in the dispersion curve? If this extreme positive dispersion can lead to slow light. If you look at the group velocity expression how uh, 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 a profile would transmit to such a material is given by the free space light speed divided by the index n. You are all familiar with that for example, for air, for glass, for uh, water 1.33, 1.5 would be the typical range of n semiconductors maybe 3, maybe 6 maximum that is what you have seen. I am talking about an ng of 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 close to 10 to the power 8. So, real real slow light, light moving at the speed of a cycle inside my material. So, not going that fast. So, can we actually use it and can we actually uh, ask the question if I could really slow it down can I actually stop it. If I stop it what would I, I achieve? I would achieve storage of information maybe if it is coded in that light. So, this is the excitement in this phenomenon called EIT. The moment I have this laser on this uh, you know this change happens the moment I turn this off of course, I go back to my original two level system. So, this is really is the idea sure yes. So, I think what uh, I am going to, going to simplify this. So, this is the probe that is going to come out and this is the control that I am using to induce these changes in the profiles. So, this would always happen when the control is on. So, I will simplify this further. So, the physics of EIT would always have this probe laser this is the one I am looking at whether it is coming out or not and this is the one I am using as called controller coupling and essentially you would always have this capital lambda kind of a configuration. So, it is called a lambda system. Now, there are many ways of understanding what the hell is going on because when this is on resonance you would always have absorption if I did not have this coupling beam. Okay. So, on resonance I am not having absorption anymore I am having perfect transparency. So, there are many ways of understanding it you can solve the full problem which I will not get into, but a very basic physics way of understanding is this that like in interference if I you know let me take a, a, a break get a question yeah. No, so let me show you what ok let me just answer uh, one would be a direct one that uh, through B to A I think the one animation got killed probably and the, the, there is a there is a way of going from B to A straight or you go B to A via this coupling beam and come back to A. This is a second order process normally you would not bother about it, but these two things together actually having the cancellation effect. So, if you if you are familiar with a uh, double slit experiment Young's double slit I have a slit I have just made two holes and I have a source of light I am looking at the interference pattern on the other side. Suppose I close one hole and let light go through on a particular spot I will actually I am receiving light okay. and then I close the other one I am also receiving light at the same spot. Now, I suddenly open both the slits it could so happen depending on where I am looking that I get no light at all. So, light plus light can be no light at all. So, if you think of it normally you do not bother about it when you see two headlights of cars crossing okay. you do not see such effects, but suppose I keep on dimming the light source and I get to the level of say one particle of light photon I mean very loosely speaking at a time that I am shooting from the source. One photon going through the slit A hitting the screen, one photon going through slit B and hitting the screen both are happening. The moment I open both, both of them go together, but they cancel each other. So, our eyes are sensitive to things that we call intensity or power they are square of amplitudes kind and they are only positive definite the minimum possible value for that is 0 when you are in a perfectly dark room intensity is 0 nobody has seen negative light. So, when two positive definite quantities add up to give you 0 it tells you the way you are adding is not correct right. So, physics is happening superposition is happening at a level 
which is below the sensory power of our eyes. Okay. So, that is the electric field, electric field is positive in this, may be negative in this, two of them cancelling each other, 0 square is 0. So, that is what you are seeing, you are seeing a dark fringe. So, when you go down to very, very low light levels, dark fringes are actually explained by saying that there are two possible paths of one photon to go through to reach that spot, one through slit A, one through slit B and these two paths interfere cancelling each other. A similar thing is happening here, there are two possible ways of lifting population from B to A, one directly, one indirectly through the coupling. These two paths are cancelling each other under certain conditions and that really is the physics of EIT, electromagnetic. Yes. Emission of virtual photon and yes, then and then emission. reabsorption. So it's a it's a third order. That's why it's actually the third order process. Very correct. So this is really the indirect path and the direct path combining together, essentially cancelling the probe absorption along this. Okay, and this happens uh, because this is actually more powerful than that. Otherwise, this order effect will not uh, actually contribute. So this is really the physics of it, and essentially, as in all interference effects. There is some kind of coherence you talk about in Young's level slate, very wrongly actually. They talk about the, uh, the coherence of uh, 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 being a condition for seeing the interference, a stable interference fringe. Uh, here also, these fragile quantum interference effects survive as long as you have Raman coherence between the two lower levels or, or the spins as we call. So, roughly that is the idea, and we have actually done, you can solve this problem. I am not going to get through this. Uh, the real issue is that if I solve the problem, solving the problem would mean do not look at the equations, not meant for you. So, uh, for example, you do the hydrogen atom problem, if you are in first year undergraduate, you know, then uh, you solve the bare atom problems. Here, the atoms are actually dressed by an optical field. So, you solve the full problem. What is interesting I want to point out is that when you solve that, you get an eigenstate, which is called the dark state. So, on two photon resonance, this has a zero probability to be excited. So, even though it is on resonance, the system has a state that is always dark, it does not see light. And uh, there are many descriptions uh, uh, for that, and we really do not need to get to that. The general EIT scheme is, as I said, is uh, a lambda system like that, and the EIT condition would be a two photon resonance when this delta r is actually zero, and uh, when this capital delta is non zero i'll consider mostly zero then uh, this is not a very very efficient system so what is the idea if i want to really do this the idea is that can i switch it's like a switch that turns things dark and uh, light dark and bright dark and bright so we can actually do many mixing of that so switch between transparency and absorption at multiple frequency create logic gates and so because it depends on in quantum interference effects it could be constructive or destructive at different frequencies and can alter dramatically. So, again the control because we have understood it and depending on the control frequency and its power, I can actually shift this EIT the way we like. To do an experiment of course, the first trick is to select a simple usable atomic level configuration. I talked about a lambda system, no real life system is that simple. Okay. So, for an experimentalist the best thing is to really look for one and we had one idea and that is what I am going to talk about. This is an, uh, the, the entire work was done in collaboration with uh, my friends in uh, Orsay in France uh, in a group and uh, very Indian looking uh, friends of mine uh, who were my collaborators for last 10 years. What we do is uh, look at uh, metastable helium. It is metastable because if you look at this is not the ground state of helium 2, 3 S 1 has a lifetime of 8000 seconds, it is as good as you know not decaying at all. So, it is almost a stable, um, metastable uh, as we call it and we select uh, a lambda system using a transition which is in the infrared 1 micron little above 1 micron. And there are tricks up our sleeves by using things called polarization, uh, circular polarization. We turn this into actually a simple lambda system by using uh, right circularly and left circularly polarized light uh, in, in the respective arms. So, uh, there are many um, good things about uh, helium 4, the metastable helium 4, you can actually use extremely low, low power diode lasers. 
uh, that are available off the shelf. And uh, there are many nice things about collisions in such helium, because when I first started talking about the system, uh, many experts have actually told me that this will not work. Room temperature systems cannot show quantum coherence effects, because there will be collisions that would actually kill everything that we wish to do. And we did not want to go into low temperature systems, because they are not they are expensive. I will be always lagging behind the best of labs in the Europe and America, and also because they cannot be taken to the field. If you wish to work uh, with uh, gadgets that are applicable, you cannot possibly, you try to avoid such sophisticated equipment, because uh, essentially you will not be able to carry it in a suitcase and go. So, this we managed to do, and it turned out things that people thought were going to affect it adversely came to our rescue. It actually became quite nice and collisions uh, when they do not destroy coherence, they help to increase transit time. So, because rather than having a ballistic motion of the helium atom through the laser beam, it does zigzag, zigzag, zigzag like a, uh, in, uh, like a diffusive motion. And therefore, the time it takes to cross the laser beam increases, therefore, your interaction time works. So, I will not get into the details in velocity changing collisions have a very positive effect. This is a tabletop setup that you see the helium beam, uh, helium cell actually is only uh, few, uh, 5 centimeters inside the shield and it is a table top experiment that you can actually do uh, to set up EIT. And lo and behold actually you get to see this is actually shown in transmission. So, a transmission peak when delta is 0, this is the inverse of this absorption that you that you see. And uh, you can make it very, very narrow, uh, uh, you know the width was about uh, 10 kilohertz or so even in a room temperature system. This of course, we published there is a lot of excitement, then we had to get into the domain of doing the modeling of it, because nobody knew how to actually work this out with all the relaxation processes we have. And the nice thing about this modeling is that you are not fiddling with numbers, numbers are already known. So, actually you are fitting the data with all known constants and trying to figure out and then excellent uh, understanding came out of this analysis that we did of this EIT. The results in the first go I will just show you is something very nice. I talked about this transmission, but remember the conjugate effect where dispersion also had a very strange looking curve. And if I instead of shining a laser which is continuous, suppose I now send beams like that, I can look at what is the speed at which it is going. Remember I talked about slow light. <coughs> Indeed, if you do that you will find even in a system which had nothing, it was a tabletop experiment with initially was a, a very, very short uh, helium cell, we could achieve a group velocity of around 3 kilometer per second. Remember the free space speed of light 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second, from there we got into 10 to the power 3 per second and uh, without having to do much. So, this was quite remarkable that uh, you can uh, do this. So, what I am going to show you uh, uh, again a cartoon, yes please. Yes. No, uh, no, I, I think you need much higher uh, power. We are actually not using that kind of power, we are using a trick in, uh, in the steepness of the dispersion curve. So, even low power is uh, capable of doing it, because we are very close to the 0 window, it is a very narrow window. But yeah, if I could put in more power and have a way of looking at it, more power would also have some effect on collisional uh, things that I have not talked about. But yes, it is in that domain, but I am not seeing it. Okay. So, let me show you a, a very brief uh, cartoon of how, what I mean by uh, quantum memory. So, how do I store and retrieve uh, information based on such an EIT protocol? Supposing this is the material, <coughs> one atom inside that material is shown in this three level structure and <coughs> this material when the probe comes, the probe is all over. Okay. Uh, sorry, the control comes, the control is all over, this is a powerful control. Now, comes a very weak probe pulse which is goes from A to B and it is coming in, it is coming in, going in and at this point if I now turn off the control, the blue one that was there then the state of light is stored in the Raman coherence of the two lower, lower states. Nothing comes out of this material, I turn on the control, then the retrieval starts happening, the probe pulse comes out in the original uh, with all the original parameters. Now, of course, there are many, many issues in here, 
how slowly can you turn off on the control field, what is the impact of spontaneous decay and can we actually apply it in a single atom tracked in an optical cavity. We tried to address all of these things uh, in uh, subsequent papers, but the excitement was that uh, starting in 1999, so it is quite old, uh, nature cover had this that in an ultra cold gas, this was really really the coldest spot in the universe kind of a gas of sodium atoms, you, people showed 17 meters per second of group velocity. Okay. It was not completely stopped and there a lot of work had happened after that in sodium and rubidium system. We are talking about uh, uh, the helium, but <coughs> essentially what I am talking about sophisticated light switches that control not just light, but information. Suppose I have coded some information in my in, in incoming light and that can be changes of modulation frequency, amplitude phase, what have you. Normally, we play with these three. So, when the light stops, that information is stored just like information is stored in electronic memory of this computer. Right? So, uh, it is a stable state unless like a switch, it is bistable, on is on, off is off, it is a basic coding device, right? till I actually disturb it, it remains that memory. Okay? So, essentially these are very complicated light switches that I am talking about and to access the information you turn on a control laser and off it comes. So, this is essentially the idea of stopping and restarting light. So, we talked about this and then some really crazy things came out of it and I am going to today I am just telling you the story I am not going to into the details of it, but there are many offshoots that are puzzling very very fundamental questions. So, in the interest of time I am just going to go through this giving you the idea and then we can talk later. Uh, I talked about this expression whether you understood or not, this has some approximation in it. I have assumed only first order, uh, second order dispersion theory, uh, first order dispersion theory right now. And uh, what we have seen is that the group velocity is given by the free space speed of light divided by the group index, okay, very simple. Now, so you can understand what I talked about that this group velocity will be much smaller than c if this one is much larger than 1. Okay just about 1, about 3, about 6 you are familiar with. Now, I am talking about much larger than 1 that is 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 of that order. Now, what happens if I have this one is less than 1, then V g would become greater than c or I can actually have a backward light where group velocity would become negative. Okay. Now, when we saw it there is nothing that we have done here that violates Maxwell or anybody essentially talks about fast light not just slow light that are counterintuitive, but it does not violate Einstein's causality. You know Einstein's special theory of relativity of comes that that speed of information cannot be greater than the speed of light. If that happened then I can go to my past kill my grandfather and so I would not be born. So, you can actually violate all kinds of principles of causality that we believe in in physics if you could transmit information faster than the speed of light, because then you can go to the past, alter things in there. So, your present would be affected. So, causal cause and effect relationships would all get violated and that is sort of something that we do not allow. There is no first proof of principle I believe, uh, you know the, the experts would correct me to prove this. So, time and again you find mostly Italian papers trying to violate causality and showing some experiment where you will find always something wrong in the explanation saying they have violated causality. So, here the point is that when I was in high school, I was told nothing can move faster than the speed of light. By the time I was in the US to do my PhD, people have actually shown experimentally very nice experiments that phase velocity that is the velocity of a frequency component of an envelope can be faster than speed of light. Okay. Nothing was violated even then. Now, I am saying group velocity can actually exceed the speed of light and textbooks should be rewritten because group velocity does not contain information. A smooth profile Gaussian, uh, if you look at a packet which extends from minus infinity to plus infinity, the problem of how we define speed you need to think of in a quantum information domain and always information is coded by turning something on. So, there is a, always a discontinuity that you find in that uh, uh, front velocity uh, that is what contains information and not the group velocity. This needs a little bit more thinking, leads a lot more debate and clear understanding of what we actually mean by that. But what I am showing here does not violate anything. When you have such sharp discontinuity, 
this expression breaks down. Be Oh, it's a belief. Uh, this is yeah. a conjecture actually, because so, what so I am talking about is that when you have such discontinuity, the first order theory breaks down, right? And you need to take care of higher order terms, which you are not doing. And the entire definition of, I uh, will show you just one reference to our work, entire definition of group velocity you have to look at. So, we did this experiment, the same experiment I showed by continuously varying the, de uh, the capital delta, which we have not talked about. And uh, in one case, we could actually go from a group velocity of a plus 10 to the power of 4 to a group velocity of minus 10 to the power of 4 meters per second. So, this was never looked at before, as I said this near to the 0 of the Raman uh, uh, detuning, uh, there was always a huge absorption. So, nobody could actually probe this area. Now, we have made it EIT that is transmit, uh, uh, transmission around that area and we can look at the dispersion curves which has these really uh, sharp kinks and it is possible to see this. So, essential there is a whole lot that we published on this talking about uh, how this concept of group velocity when you are doing this kind of stuff sort of breaks down. So, uh, we I was invited to actually do this uh, review on this. So, there is some details that are given in there and more or less now it is accepted that what I am saying is that your concept of uh, the decay rate for different frequencies and therefore, the group velocity breaks down when you are playing with such kinks and information. So, I think a separate one that I once uh, discussed with Professor Ray also, that a separate thing should be all quantum information, the speed of propagation, the entire concept is a little crazy, it is not the way it should be formulated. And I think that is where the problem lies, that if you believe in the old concepts, then what it is saying is the negative group velocity is what we saw, is that before the beam enters, it is actually come out of the medium already. So, essentially says this propagation description that we are giving is actually faulty. So, again I know I have sort of bombarded with some concept, but these are all following logically from known physics. When you have understood, we can actually try to use it to control. It got us interested in looking at these transmission resonances of different kinds. Uh, I talked about uh, phase related or coherence related uh, uh, such uh, altered resonances. Uh, there could be even population related resonances. I would not get into the details of it, but essentially here there are no atomic coherence in more then it goes by uh, the name of coherence population oscillation. So, this is also something that we have probed very, very deeply in, uh, in this uh, helium atomic system. Uh, having done a three level system, we got excited to talk about what looks like a tripod. It is like a double lambda if you like and a double EIT when you have PhD student working for you, it is easy to do these kind of calculations, because it is much more complicated. You are talking about now a four level atomic system, three classical fields and so three Raman coherences, two dark states, so lots of complication, but it is more fun, because now you have more controls in your hand and actually you can play with this thing, very, very interesting physics uh, and many uh, theoretical papers were there, but experimental results were not there and again there is a lot of application you can think of in magneto optic switches, now not just with laser light but using a magnetic field and for quantum information storage. We use the helium, the same metastable helium, but a different transition uh, for to go to the upper level and again it is a matter of detail, they are all published work, you do not need to worry about it. Very, very simple experimental setup again. The only thing that is different here is that we have actually put some homemade rectangular coils around our helium cell to be able to control a very weak magnetic field that was needed in this case. Very simple experiments were done. With depending on the configuration of who is being shared in the double EIT, in this one is this is the shared one that is shown, and then uh, there is nothing exciting in this particular case. But when you actually uh, have uh, the coupling beam in on the two arm and the major one is the probe, then there are interesting interference effects that you could see. And uh, something that was uh, shown as black uh, that uh, was fully transmi uh, transmitting suddenly became an absorption dip and now this is being controlled by the field as well as the magnetic field. A lot of work we have done uh, in playing with this funny stuff and uh, essentially you know uh, went on and on and on uh, doing some. So, the system uh, again be useful as a polarization dependent switch in the presence of a magnetic field and uh, recently we have actually done some storage experiments looking at uh, whether we can uh, do light storage, what is the capability of these things, because the main concern for us was also 
that when I am using a room temperature system and decoherence because of velocity change collisions are happening, then can I really store light for a long enough time for us to use. Again we worked it out and then came to some applications, which uh, again for want of time I would not get into that uh, details. But to give you an idea, when I am coding some information into the light, okay, the, the information that I am coding can also have very many parameters in it. As I said, normally you uh, modulate the frequency or the amplitude or the phase or all three or combinations thereof. Uh, it is possible to actually code it with highly non-classical, highly quantum information into the light. One such thing is uh, what we call squeeze light okay? and uh, it is to do with the fact that uh, classically you know two quantities like the position and the momentum of a harmonic oscillator you can measure with absolute certainty. Nothing says that you know if I know x for sure I cannot know v for sure, but for a quantum particle uh, these two conjugate variables you can never measure simultaneously with absolute precision. So, if I am a quantum particle, if I know, if you know my position very, very accurately, then my velocity would be a completely fuzzy one, you would not be able to do. So, uh, what we understood is that there is an uncertainty principle that is about the product of these two uncertainties, right. It says that must be greater than a certain fundamental constant, okay. What we realize that the uncertainty principle is about a product. It does not say anything about individual uncertainties. So, can I be smart enough? to squeeze the noise out of one at the cost of of course, increased noise in the other maintaining Heisenberg, but using the one that has less noise for all optical measurement purposes. And that is what uh, squeeze lines try to do and we have actually shown this to also uh, be a nearly perfect squeezer uh, in this system. So, essentially you do by uh, creating uh, quantum sources that are like twin brothers. So, one has noise of this kind, the other one would be nullifying it all the time. So, if I use them together, I can actually create a nearly perfect squeezed light in this. So, this is a, a very, very involved experiment that we did last year and this year, I do not know whether you have seen earlier this year, we have come up with a theory and come some nice names of uh, popular return, a uh, new kind of quantum excitons that you can think of in a system of this. So, uh, I, I I stop here and just quickly go through the summary saying that a room temperature system which is in the bulk, I am not talking about effect with one helium atom, I am talking about the bulk and I am actually using it in a room temperature gas. Uh, it is an attractive system even to do such quantum coherence and quantum uh, mechanical effect and uh, we designed a very, very clean lambda system thanks to polarization selection and then been able to talk about slow light and very interestingly backward light. Uh, group velocity of few thousand meters per second was actually seen even in a cell that was only 2.5 centimeter long. We have increased it now and we have actually done further. Uh, so, quantum storage experiments based on such uh, electromagnetically induced transparency and coherence population oscillation uh, actually could be demonstrated. A matter of principle right now, but uh, it would uh, it would be quite robust if you could use CPO and not EIT because EIT is essentially very, very sensitive because it depends on quantum coherence effects. So, uh, a quantum information system of course, uh, what people have been thinking about for a long time is that uh, photonic qubits you use appropriate for communication over distance. You want to send an information qubit is quantum bit, bit is binary digit that zeros and ones that you use in a classical computer. A qubit is a quantum computer which is combinations of zeros and ones more like not yes, not no, but maybes and it has infinite information content in them. And so, if I can transfer those over a long distance without knowing what it is, normally you use photonic qubits and to store you use atomic systems because photons are difficult to localize and that is why I talked about this particular experiment. So, the information is getting stored as memories in atomic qubits. So, when I transfer from uh, something that is carrying the signal to something that is going to store the signal and again take it out. This would mean an atom photon network and at every level when you transfer information from the photon to the atom, atom to the photon information that is quantum information that you do not know what it is. You know it is a combination of 0 and 1, what are the amplitudes of the 2 and this you do not know. So, this is uh, information transfer problem 
that we have worked uh, heavily in our group to look at how do you actually transfer such quantum information and make an atom photon network that is the future of quantum information system. Uh, must acknowledge most of my work was uh, funded by DST, a uh, lot of uh, this exchange programs could happen because of generous funding from CEFIPRA. Uh, in France, I was an invited professor uh, and then my students were supported by CSIR. Uh, I end with uh, the moral of the story. What I am talking about is that evolution of physics and physics is the theory of science. You know, it happens when theory and experiment go hand in hand and very naturally some applications come out, right. But if you are always concentrating on market value of the research and think of what is going to come out tomorrow, then you are going to kill this evolution and if you kill this evolution, then this would die its natural death. So, uh, when uh, 1960 the laser was invented, probably you know, everybody said, oh great fundamental tool, what is the use? By the time I landed in the US, that question was never asked. Every supermarket had a laser for, uh, for a reader. And so, if there is a time scale uh, which biotechnologists and information technologies normally do not understand because it is instantaneous transfer to the technology domain. But in physics and most of science, there is a time lag from when you are doing this necessary gambling of theory and experiment, you are actually excited about probing a question and then trying to find out why is and, and actually as I said how things happen in nature. Okay. As a result, these applications come out and will it be that one day we all would know all the secrets of nature and physicists would become jobless? I doubt that would ever happen. We will keep on pushing the frontier of knowledge using the methodology that I talked about as scientific methods and that would continue. So, I am uh, thrilled uh, and I must extend my personal congratulations to the winners and to all the participants and to the Humibhava Center for doing such a wonderful job of uh, bringing in people who would just keep on celebrating what I call scientific methodology for want of a better name and this celebration should continue for years to come. So, thank you again very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Take some questions. Yes, please. Yeah. Is there are questions from the audience? The students? Okay, maybe I, I will start yes, with a question myself. So, uh, can you tell us, uh, of course, this is contrary to the spirit you just described uh, about uh, the applications, but I understand that uh, quantum information, quantum computing is very much in the news nowadays. And uh, so, can you explain in, uh, in a language that uh, all of us can understand about how these things uh, can actually lead to computation or uh, storage and uh, transmission of information. Yes, thanks. Uh, you know, the quest has been on. The, the major problem here, well, first of all, for quantum uh, information processing, the kind of quantum computers we are thinking of, they are not going to totally replace your classical computers. This gadget uses many things that are quantum mechanical, but the algorithm it uses is classical. Okay? So, quantum computers based on certain quantum algorithms would be able to solve certain kinds of problems that you would be unable to solve or take zillions of years to solve in a classical way. Okay? And a factorization being one that uh, was talked about, which is essentially the security key for all your transactions including ATM. So, it depends on your inability, classical computers inability to factorize a huge number. So, the way this system works is that the system is, if it is essentially quantum mechanical, it works under quantum dynamics. So, it has its own thing and all the qubits I am talking about should come under the same kind of framework of dynamics. That is the major problem actually for an experimentalist to make sure they are all subjected to the same dynamical transformations. Now, having done that, if the result could be, the result is when you observe. The moment you observe a quantum bit, it becomes a classical one. Okay? So, if it is a combination of unknown combination of zeros and 1, the moment it is like the Shunja cat. How many of you have heard of it? So, I will just give you that example if you do not know. It is a nice story. I mean, I am an animal lover. I do not like this much. But anyway, the, the story is the following that uh, Shunja knew this. Uh, and he talked about this as a post-mortem physics or some such thing. That supposing in a box, I put a cat and a radioactive nucleus okay, and assume both of them are quantum mechanical. So, if the uh, radioactive nucleus decays, it triggers a poison and the cat dies, something like that. Okay? And if it does not decay, 
then the cat is alive. So, before I open the box, the cat is in a state of being dead and alive together. Okay. In a, our real life, we have never seen a cat which is both dead and alive, but the moment I observe, it collapses to either the dead state or the, or the live state. Okay. So, it is like uh, an atom being excited, electron in, of an atom being excited by the laser beam. The electron could be either upstairs or downstairs, if I could single out two le levels. Okay. In between, it could be spinning between the two. So, the state of the system is not upstairs, not downstairs, but a mixture of up and down, anything, any mixture. Okay. So, this is what we exploit in a quantum dynamics, but the moment you observe, it loses its charm of being quantum. So, it is very, very fragile. It collapses being a classical information, either dead or alive, either upstairs or downstairs. Okay. So, this is really the catch, and this is where people have been looking for systems of not just one qubit, but you need n, I mean millions of qubits to, uh, to do the uh, processing that you would like. So, there are many candidates for this now, and what I am talking about is more on the global level of the platform of decoding it in a, in a, uh, from a photonic system to an atomic system, and then recovering that system without knowing which combination of dead and alive the photon is. So, that really is the trick. And so, there have been many success stories recently using silicon, the people could get a uh, huge number of uh, such quantum dots to talk together, but the idea of manipulation still beats, uh, you know, what we need to do. So, I do not know whether I will see a quantum computer in my lifetime, I hope so. Uh, at least, uh, you know, some bits, 3 qubits to 7 qubits to some more have been actually demonstrated in the labs already, but we need, of course, to scale it up much more. Questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah I, I think this is probably a little provocative question. This is about again uh, group velocity being faster than speed of light. Yes. So I understand that you don't, we don't expect causality to be violated. Uh, but one is not just using Maxwell equation here. There are quantum mechanics at play, and we really don't understand quantum mechanics that well. So what I wanted to ask is that though while there are attempts going on to understand the meaning of group velocity and what it means to transfer energy and things like that. As an experimentalist, once this is there, you have group, group velocity, larger than speed of light. Are there any attempts to actually try to see if experimentally you can communicate information faster than speed of light? Yeah, actually, yes, experimentally. yes, I think that's what we did, and that's what my conclusion in that paper was. Essentially, uh, uh, there will be so much of distortion in the in the information because we have not done the theory properly. So the group velocity definition here to relook. That's the point, really. The, so definition of group velocity is breaking down when you go. Group velocity essentially have many frequencies in it. In a cavity, when you are talking about, the decay rates are all different. So, when you superpose all such exponentially decaying rates, it is a different beast altogether. So, and that is what people have to look at. And so, we had a meaning of this, but it is nothing to do with the coding that we had done. Okay, thank you. So, students, either it is very clear or it's totally unclear, or you're too sleepy after a heavy breakfast. All right, Any I'm questions? available. I mean, you can uh, you can uh, write to me later if you feel too shy today. To <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's thank uh, Professor Ghosh uh, for our lecture. Thank you.